should be in 2 Kings 17. We've noted the section about the leper's report in 2 Kings, not 17, 2 Kings 7. And we finished that up with verse 20 where the individual who had doubted Elisha got himself trampled to death. And that would be on page 27 of your syllabus. You'll note on the other side of that page is Jehoram's reign. This is Jehoram of Judah. And his death is noted in 2 Kings 8, verses 23 and 24. And I believe we've already noted that. He's called Joram right there. And he dies and is buried. And Ahaziah, his son, became king in his place. And he is the one that married Athaliah, walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and was smitten by the Lord with the disease of the bowels. And then on page 28 of the syllabus, we start out with Ahaziah up at the top of Judah. And he comes to power in the 12th year of Jehoram of Israel. And that's what it notes in 2 Kings 8.25. And then 2 Kings 9.29 notes the 12th year, or it may be the other way around. But one is a session year rating, the other a session year reign, and the other is not a session year. You can go back and look at that. You don't need to spend too much time with that. Somebody may ask you a question about that. You can explain it to them, and we'll probably get them all confused about it. So I'm not going to ask him any more questions. So you will have accomplished a good purpose in doing it. So 2 Kings 8 and verse 24, the latter part of verse 24, Ahaziah, his son, became king in his place. And then it goes on to note through verse 26. So Joram slept with his father, was buried with his father in the city of David. Ahaziah, his son, became king in his place. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaziah was 22 years old, became king. He reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri, king of Israel. Interesting, it says Omri, king of Israel. That's the father of Ahab. But uh, Omri is the one that uh, got this house going in that wrong direction. And uh, Omri is the one that marries off Ahab to Jezebel. So she's a Sidonian princess. And then it doesn't know much. Well, it tells a little bit about Athaliah right at the beginning that she's born into that relationship. And uh, that's a political relationship. No, you marry my daughter, and we'll have a good uh, political relationship here. And, and of course, God is constantly noting about not doing that. Now, in 2 Kings 8 and verse 27, Ahaziah's character says, He walked in the way of the house of Ahab, did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab had done, because he was a son-in-law of the house of Ahab. So, the house of Ahab is of the northern kingdom of Israel. And this is the kingdom of the southern kingdom of Judah. So his character is going to be really uh, connected to the evil doings of the house of Israel, primarily because of Athaliah. Now you'll note on the other side of the uh, syllabus, Elisha's conversation with Haziel uh, of Syria, and that's found in 2 Kings 8, verses 7 through 15. So we just jump back a little bit there in 2 Kings 8. And this is of interest because Elijah was earlier the one who was told to go and talk to Ben-Hadad. Well, he never got around to doing that because he's taken from Elisha, you remember, in the in the uh, 
where the chariot of fire is noted. And so Elisha is left to carry out that assignment that was originally given to Elijah. So in 2 Kings 8, verses 7 through 15, it says, Then Elisha came to Damascus. Damascus is the capital city of the Syrian nation. Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was sick. We don't know which Ben-Hadad this is. We don't know if this is Ben-Hadad 1 or Ben-Hadad 2. They all could fall within this time frame. And ben, of course, is the Aramaic for son of, so he's the son of Hadad. And that doesn't tell you much more than that. But uh, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was sick, and it was told him, saying, The man of God has come here. And the king said to Haziel, Haziel may be the second in command, maybe the right-hand man of uh, Ben-Hadad. So take a gift in your hand, go meet the man of God. In other words, go talk to Elisha, Elisha here in Damascus. Inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Will I recover from this sickness? Now, we've already uh, we've already noted Naaman the leper, and we've already noted that Naaman was a Syrian captain. So we shouldn't be surprised that the king right here has some information concerning Elisha, because Elisha was was behind uh, all of that. You remember, that's when Gehazi, his servant, ends up being leprous because he takes some of the gifts. So, right here in verse 8, when it says, go to meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord, that could be all information that had been, that has been given to the king, or at least to those within the royal household, at an earlier time by Naaman. But we don't pick up Naaman again. The last we saw of him is what we have already covered. But it's just of interest that a Gentile, idolatrous individual would be concerned about God and one who is the man of God. So saying, will I recover from this sickness? So he's ill. So Haziel went to meet him and took a gift in his hand, even every kind of good thing of Damascus, 40 camels. Now, among the people, ancient people of this time, a lot of the gift giving was for show. And so as you look at this, you might say 40 camels, and they were all loaded down. No, this could just be 40 camels without any load on any of them. This is just a big show. Got 40 camels here in a caravan, and they're yours. Now, remember that Naaman tried to give Elisha some goods, remember, changing their clothes and silver. And Gehazi took it, but Elisha did not take it. So we'll see how 40 camels, uh, but it says 40 camels loads. They, they might not be, uh, they may all have some load, but uh, may not be fully laden. It's just sort of a, a show, it's very common. And he came and stood before him and said, Your son Ben Hadad, king of Aram, it sent me to you. Now, the reason why he says your son is because he wants him to, to uh, understand that there is peace between Ben-Hadad and Elisha. And so he comes with a notation of respect. And the notation of respect is Ben-Hadad is your son. Well, he's not. He's not uh, ethnically of the same group of the people. One's a Jew and the other's a Gentile. But uh, it says, Your son, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to you, saying, Will I recover from this sickness? Then Elisha said to him, Go say to him, You shall surely recover. Well, there's two reasons for him to say that. And don't get confused as we get a little bit further on in there. First of all, that's what he's going to say anyway. I mean, if Elisha were to say, well, let me tell you exactly what's going to happen to you, then, well, he wouldn't tell him that anyway. But the Lord has shown me that he will certainly die. 
Now, the point is that he's going to die, but the question is, will I die from the sickness? And I know this is a fine point, but what he's saying is, no, you'll not die from the sickness. The sickness is not going to do him in. Haziel is going to do him in. And we would assume that Elisha knows that because of what he's going to do here in the next verse. So, go say to him, you shall surely recover. In other words, if Haziel wasn't going to kill him from the sickness. But the Lord has shown me, and he's talking to Haziel, the Lord has shown me he will certainly die. Now, verse 11 is important. It goes along with verse 10, and it says, And he fixed his gaze steadily on him has been inserted. But it's in reference to Elisha making eye contact with Haziel, and he won't break eye contact. It says, Until he was ashamed, that's Haziel, and the man of God wept. So as soon as he is ashamed, as soon as he uh, soon breaks eye contact and turns away, the man of God weeps. So Haziel is fixed with his gaze until he feels embarrassed. And he's talking to a man of God. And he's probably thinking he knows exactly what's going to happen. The man of God wept. And Haziel said, Why does my Lord weep? Then he answered, Because I know the evil that you will do to the sons of Israel. So he's, he's got some information already from God as to what Haziel is going to do in warfare against the sons of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire, and their young men you will kill with the sword, and their little ones you will dash in pieces, and that's very typically where in ancient times and done even today, but it's done more with a gun than it is with anything else, the killing of everybody, uh, where they just grab the child up by the legs and smash their skull against a, a rock, dash in pieces. And their women with child you will rip up, always sort of a fascination to the male ego, as to what that's all about, but in their cruelty, they would grab a hold of pregnant women and slice them open. Then Haziel said, now this, this response here in verse 13 is probably a response of mock humility. And he says, but what is your servant? You mean poor, humble me, who is but a dog? Now, a, a dog is not a household pet. The dog is a, a base creature, and and when you call someone a dog, it's a, a, a remark of extreme contempt. You dog. So am, am I just a dog that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, the Lord has shown me that you will be king over Aram. Well, the way he's going to be king over Aram Haziel is going to go back and assassinate Ben-Hadad. So Elisha knows that. But Elisha also knows that Haziel then will start up warfare again with Israel, and there will be a bunch of Israelites who will be killed as a result of all that. And so Haziel probably never expected that much information being given to him. The question was simply, will I recover from this sickness? and a lot of this information for Haziel himself. So we note in verse 14, so he departed from Elisha and returned to his master who said to him, what did Elisha say to you? And he answered, he told me that you would surely recover. And that would have been true if Haziel had not done what he did in verse 15. And it came out on the morrow, the next day, then he took the cover, this would be a, a, a thick piece of cloth that was probably covering him in like a blanket, dipped it in water, and spread it on his face so that he died and Haziel became king in his place. 
So he suffocated him. And we would assume that in this sickness, he's virtually paralyzed. He's not able to do anything. He's not able to grab a hold of the cloth and remove it from his face. And just having it soaked, it just settles down over his face. And sort of like early waterboarding, except this is a bit more fatal than waterboarding. Of course, waterboarding can be fatal, but that's what he does. So this is all dealing with AZL and what AZL is going to do. And that takes us down to verse 15. Now you'll note on your syllabus that Ahaziah, who is the king of Judah, is going to give aid to Jehoram at the battle of Ramoth-Gilead. Ramoth-Gilead is still in the news in 2 Kings 8 and verse 28. And he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Aziel, king of Aram, at Ramoth-Gilead. Now, that time that Ahab and Jehoshaphat went against Ramoth-Gilead, remember, Ahab was struck in a chink within the armor, and he bled out in the chariot, and they brought him back to Jezreel and washed the blood out. The dogs licked the blood of Ahab. Well, that was 14 years earlier, so 14 years have gone by since all of that took place. That was back in 1 Kings 22. So again, here's the king of Judah and the king of Israel. They're going to go up against Haziel because Haziel is now king because he just killed, assassinated Ben-Hadad. And the Arameans in this particular battle wounded Joram or Jehoram of Israel. So you come down to Jehoram returns to be healed in Jezreel. In 2 Kings 8 and verse 29, so King Joram returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Arameans had afflicted on him at Ramah. Ramah is just another form of Ramoth Gilead. So this is the same at Ramah. When he fought against Aziel, king of Aram, then Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram. So they have in Jezreel because he was sick. So there's been a battle. Uh, Ahaziah has not been wounded. Uh, Jehoram has been wounded. He's in Jezreel. And then Ahaziah, you'll note in your syllabus outline, is going to visit Jehoram in Israel. So that both of them will be in Jezreel together to await something that's going to happen. Now, in your syllabus, you'll note in 2 Kings 9, verses 1 through 10, that we're dealing with a fellow by the name of Jehu. Now, Jehoram is wounded. He's in Israel. And uh, there's another work to be done by Elisha that was supposed to be done by Elijah, but it was not accomplished in his time. And so in 2 Kings 9, verses 1 through 10, we're introduced to a new king, or one who's going to be a king of Israel, in 2 Kings 9. It says, now, Elisha, the prophet, called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Gird up your loins. That always means you're going to take a fast trip. Gird up your loins. And we're not talking about him giving him a, a mule to ride or a donkey to ride. You're just going to run there. Gird up your loins and take this flask of oil in your hand. This is an anointing flask. And go to Ramoth Gilead. There we are. That's where the, the battle was taking place. And that's where Joram was wounded. So Joram left the battle to go to Jezreel. He's wounded, but the army is still at Ramoth Gilead. When you arrive there, search out Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and bid him arise from among his brothers, 
and bring him to an inner room. Now, if you go back to 1 Kings 19, 1 Kings 19, Dave, I'm trying to understand that they, that they often cross like that. Uh, Jehoshaphat being in Judah and then his son Jehu in Israel? Or? No, that's not, it. that's not his son. Jehu is in Israel all the time. He's in the army. He's in the Israelite army. We, we've already, we've already uh, taken care of Jehoshaphat. He's gone a long time ago. This this is this is not the same Jehoshaphat. Okay. This is a Jehoshaphat who's in Israel. The other Jehoshaphat we saw was in Judah. Okay. So that's that's the problem. You got some of these guys have the same names, and so don't get yourself confused by that. That just gives the lineage of Jehu who he is. So First Kings 19 and verse 16. This is what Elijah was supposed to do. Go back there and look. Go back to 1 Kings, 1 Kings 19. And start out with verse 15. The Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you have arrived, you shall anoint Haziel, king of Aram. Well, Haziel is the one that Elisha has already talked to that killed Ben Hadad. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. That's the Jehu we're talking about right now. <clears throat> so there's two jobs that Elijah was supposed to do. He passed them on to Elisha. Or at least God passed them on to Elisha. And the third thing was, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, or Abel Mahalah, you shall anoint his prophet in your place. So there's three works to be done by Elijah. The only one that he's able to accomplish is his successor, Elisha. The Jehu, that's who we're talking about now. Aziel, we've already talked about. That was all done through Elisha. So we come back to we come back to uh, Jehu, and it's not even going to be Elisha. Elisha has sent one of the sons of the prophets back here in 2 Kings 9. And he said, you go up to Ramoth Gilead. That's where the army is stationed. That's where they're fighting against the Syrians. That's where Jehoram has already been wounded and gone back to Jezreel. So you go up there and search out this guy. Now, how do I know which Jehu this is? Well, this is Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. There's just going to be one of them with that lineage. So we don't have Jehu Jones or Jehu Smith. It's just Jehu. It's always somebody, the son of somebody. And we're, we're not into family names yet. That doesn't come until Roman times. So you take him into an inner room, then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel, then open the door and flee and do not wait. <laughs> That's sort of an early ice bucket thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's a run by anointing. <laughs> and, so, and so don't stick around. This is Jehu, the son of Nimshi, and he may just be unhappy that you just poured a flask of oil over his head. It'll be a little bit easier to wipe up cold water than it is oil. Maybe we ought to start the oil thing. <laughs> Bucket of oil. That would get expensive. I'll take uh, 10 W30. <laughs> Fork would do it. You ever seen how much is in a fork? You ever smell the quart of oil yeah. on the garage floor? It goes yeah. on forever. Uh, could it be possible that he's also being told to basically annoy him and get out because it could turn very violent? Oh, I'm sure that's what it's all about. Now, he's going to say more than this, but this is basically the message. Pour the oil on him, tell him you've anointed him as king over Israel, and then get out. 
Let him stick around. So, we'll see what he does. Verse 4, so the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to reign with Gideon. When he came, behold, the captains of the army were sitting, and he said, I have a word for you, O captain. Well, it's already captains, so, well, which captain? And Jehu said, for which one of us? And he said, for you, O captain. I don't know how he knew that that was Jehu. Maybe he listened to some of the conversation before he uh, got to uh, uh, make this announcement. And he arose and went into the house, verse 6, and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel, and you shall strike the house. See, there's a little bit more information than what we saw back here in verse 3. You shall strike the house of Ahab, your master. Now, the house of Ahab, your master, is wounded Jehoram at Jezreel, remember? Wounded Jehoram at Jezreel. He's already been, been at Ramoth Gilead and got himself in the way of an arrow, probably. <clears throat> so you shall strike the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets. Now, my servants, the prophets, connected with Ahab. What's that all about in verse 7? My servants, the prophets, and Ahab. And then you can insert another name in there, and you can see why God is avenging. These are all the prophets that Jezebel killed? The what? All the prophets that Jezebel killed? Yeah. And remember that there was a fellow who had hidden away uh, two groups, a hundred prophets in caves, and so it's for all the prophets that Jezebel has, has killed. So because Ahab is her husband, he's the one who's held responsible for what Jezebel has done as far as God is concerned. And this is one of the reasons why he's bringing the house to a very abrupt end very quickly. And Jehu is the one that God has chosen to replace Ahab so that I may go back to verse 7, avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. So there it is. Jezebel is the one who is responsible for that. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male person, both bond and free, in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Remember, it only survived to his, the time of his son, then it was done away with. Like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, the same thing with the house of Basha. And the dog shall eat Jezebel. Now we see something's going to happen to Jezebel. Now all this information is being given to Jehu right here. And uh, a little bit more information than, than we first noted. <coughs> And the dog shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, so the same place where her husband's blood was washed out of the chariot. And none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. So <laughs> he has a little bit more to say, but we still have he opened the door and fled. And that's exactly what he was told in verse 3 to do. Open the door and flee. Now, in verses 11 through 13, we're going to see that Jehu is going to be proclaimed king. You see that in your syllabus there. Now, Jehu came out uh, to the servants of his master. Now, his master is Jehoram. And the servants of his master would be Jehu and these other captains. So he's come out to the, these other captains. And one said to him, it is all well. And then he asks a second question, why did this mad fellow come to you? And he said to them, you know very well the man and his talk. Now verse 11, you're going to have to think about it for a little bit. What does he mean by that? He must be talking about Elisha. Well, he's talking about Elisha. So what does he they said, what did he want? And he said, you know what he wanted. How, how did he know that they knew? Because of what he was probably carrying, that anointing flask. And what? 
Because he was carrying the anointing flask, most likely, or well, that's his dress. Might be. And, or right, because he split out. The door is closed. Door. Right. Right. Uh. Mm. They're all up against the door. <laughs> it doesn't say that, but he knows that they are those kind of individuals, because he's probably been involved in doing that himself. Wouldn't he still have the oil like dripping off of his head? <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Running out all the ringlets of his hair. They wore their hair long in those days, so it would be. But and that would be a clear indication of that. But he said, "You really know more than just what you observe in my coming out and and uh, because he says you know very well the man and number two his talk." So his talk would be the clear indication that they're at the door listening. And they said, it is a lie. You know, they're going to say, no, we weren't at the door listening. Well, yeah, you were. Tell us now. And he said, thus and thus, he said to me, thus says the Lord, I've anointed you king over Israel. Now, these are his buddies. Then they hurried, and each man took his garment and placed it under it on the bare steps, and blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. And so they declare him. They all they all like that idea. He's, he's uh, and of course, <laughs> they better like the idea. That I don't think anyone's going to stand against Jehu and say, no, don't want you to be king. Okay. Let's uh, see what happens when I draw my sword. So in verses 14 to 23, right here, Jehu is going to travel to Jezreel. We can see that in 2 Kings 9 and verse 14. So, so Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. This is Joram or Jehoram of Israel. So he's going to uh, make a run for Jezreel and he's then going to come in contact now Joram with all Israel was defending Ramoth Gilead against the Hazel of King of Aram. But Joram's not there. Remember, he's in Jezreel. So King, but King Joram had returned to Jezreel to be healed of the wounds which the Arameans had inflicted on him when he fought with Hazel, King of Aram. So Jehu said, If this is your mind, then let no one escape or leave the city to go tell it to Jezreel. Now he's talking to his captains who have just laid their cloaks on the ground, and have declared Jehu is king, back in verse 13. So what he's saying is, don't broadcast that information. Because if you do, then Joram's going, uh, Joram or Jehoram's going to make a run for it. If he makes a run for it, then I'll not be able to carry out what I've been told by this son of the prophet as a message from Elisha. So in verse 16, then Jehu rode in a chariot, went to Jezreel, where Joram was lying there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, had come down to see Joram. So you got the king of Judah and the king of Israel both in Jezreel at the same time. The king of Judah is making a sick call. The one who is sick is the one who's been wounded. That's the king of Israel. <coughs> Jehu is on his way. And so when you're looking at verse 17, it says, Now the watchman was standing in the t on the tower in Jezreel. This would be a watchtower. Many times towers were built around vineyards where you could watch over your vineyard to make sure someone's not in there stealing your grapes. But this is probably a, a watchtower on the city of Jezreel. And he saw the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, this is the message going back and forth. This is Joram who's trying to recover from his wound. Joram said, take a horseman and send him to meet them and let him say, he is at peace. Now, there's two thoughts concerning is at peace. Number one would be, are you coming in peace? Or number two, have you beaten the Syrians at Ramoth Gilead? Remember, that's where he's coming from. So either one might be the thought that's being noted here. But more than likely, 
Are you coming in peace? In other words, why would you have left the battle? Why have I not received any information as to the fact that we've won the battle of Ramoth Gilead? So is it peace? So a horseman went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What have you to do with peace? Turn behind me. And the watchman, that's a threat, by the way, if you didn't pick that up, turned behind me, and the watchman reported, The messenger came to them, but he did not return. Now that does not bode well. Verse 19, Then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, Thus says the king is at peace, and Jehu answered, What have you to do with peace? Turn behind me. And the watchman reported, He came even to them, and he did not return. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. So Jehu has the reputation of being a wild chariot driver. Maybe he's got three horses instead of two. <laughs> Maybe he's feeding them something special. Maybe the horses are dope. But he's faster than anybody else. If you don't mess with him in a quarter mile, right? Uh, he'll get you every day. So he drives furiously. So he is seen as a wild chariot driver. So in verse 21, then Joram... Joram said, get ready. And they made his chariot ready. Joram's going to go out to meet him in a chariot. Something's not right. Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. They went out to meet Jehu, found him in the property of, guess who? Naboth. Naboth the Jezreelite. They came out when Joram saw Jehu. Then he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace so long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? So Joram reigned about. In other words, he's going to get that cherry turned around as fast as he can. And fled and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between his arms. He's probably not wearing armor because he's been on a sick bed and he just goes out to meet Jehu. He's already been told that it's Jehu. And Jehu was one of his captains. And the arrow went through his heart and he sank in his chariot. Then Jehu said to Bidkar, his officer, Take him up, cast him into the property of the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite. For I remember when you and I were riding together after Ahab, his father, that the Lord laid this oracle against him. So Jehu remembers the thoughts that were expressed concerning the field of Naboth. Verse 26, Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth, and the blood of his son, says the Lord, and I will repay you in this property, says the Lord. Now then, take and cast him into the property according to the word of the Lord. So Jehu says, we're going to meet all of the expectations that God has for this that's taking place. Now, here we have the next page on the syllabus, which would be page 29. Jehoram and Ahaziah go out to meet Jehu, 2 Kings 9, verses 21 through 23, and Jehoram's death, verses 24 through 26. So they cast him onto the property, and but Ahaziah is going to be killed at the same time. Verses 27 and 28, when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was visiting. That's what you get. <laughs> when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house. And Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him too in the chariot. So they shot him at the ascent of Gur, which is at Iblim. But he fled to Megiddo and died there. So he's wounded severely, but he's going to bleed out. 
And by the time he gets to Megiddo, now remember that Megiddo is that fort at the foot of the Valley of Esdralon. The Valley of Esdralon is the valley that runs from a northwesterly location to a southeasterly location from Mount Carmel. This is all up in that area, Mount Carmel. So he makes it to Megiddo and died there. Then it says in verse 28, Then his servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in the grave of his fa- with his fathers in the city of David. So he's within the line. Uh, his mother is Athaliah. And uh, he dies. And then we're going to see in 2 Kings 10 in just a moment. The, all the rest of his house is going to be destroyed. Now going back to Israel, with, uh, with the death of Jehoram, in 2 Kings 9, verse 26, we drop down to 2 Kings 9, verses 30 through 37. So when Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. So all this time, uh, she has been still around. We've just not heard anything from her. Uh, earlier, when her husband died as a result of being wounded at Ramoth Gibeah, that was 14 years earlier. So 14 years have gone by. We've not heard anything from Jezebel. But here she is. She's at Jezreel. And uh, so when Jehu comes into Jezreel, Verse 30, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window. So she's just a, a woman who feels like she can't go out in public unless she's got her makeup on. <laughs> After her husband, the king, died, does she have any kind of a power anymore or any longer? Cause no, because she's got a son who's ruling, so she's just ruling through the son. And as Jehu entered the gate, she said, Is it well, Zimri, your master's murderer? Now, you can go back and, and know Zimri is one of those early assassins. And so she calls him Zimri. Well, she knows who he is. The wild chariot driver, Jehu. But she just calls him an assassin. Then he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And two or three officials looked down at him, and he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled. That's after the splat. (laughs) (laughs) Was sprinkled on the wall. Forensic scientists have a great time with blood splatter. This would be time way before forensic scientists. And on the horses, and he trampled her (coughs) underfoot. Whoops, my chariot got away. Whoops, it backed up. Whoops, it backed up. Whoops, it backed up. He just going to make sure she's done in. When he came back, when he came in, he ate and drank, and he said, See now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. Who is she the daughter of? You remember? Foreign country, Gentile. Baal. True. Sidonian. She's Sidonian. And her dad's name was Ethbal. Ethbal. She is a king's daughter. So Jehu is saying, well, she deserves better than this. (laughs) He's got second thoughts. Maybe it's because he's eating lunch, you know. And <laughs> After that. he's thought about that. And he doesn't want to get sick to his stomach. I don't know. These guys are all pretty uh, cold when it comes to, to death. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. That's a pretty... Uh, Those are some hungry dogs. Hungry dogs, yes. Yeah. Therefore they returned and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke. That takes you back to 1 Kings 21, 23, by the way. 
This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, In the property of Jezreel, the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung. You all understand what dung is? On the face of the field in the property of Jezreel, so they cannot say, This is Jezebel. She's, you know, no DNA back in those days. And, of course, you'd have the hands and fingerprints, but there's no fingerprinting, so they would have no way of telling who this was, that whatever was left of her. And, of course, wild animals like dogs tend to carry pieces away, so she'd be scattered all over the place. And all they could find were palms of her hands and stuff. And that's the end of Jezebel. Anyone have any thoughts about any of that? Lunchtime. What? Lunchtime. Lunchtime. Dave, I don't know if you mentioned this before, but does the name Jezreel have anything to do with her? No. No. Jezebel was seen to be probably a Hebrew derivation of the Phoenician name of Jezreel. Is completely Hebrew name. So we've got uh, Jezebel's death. <coughs> then when we come down to chapter 10, verses 1 to 11, we're going to see Ahab's house being destroyed. Now Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria to the rulers of Jezreel, the elders, and to the guardians of the children of Ahab, saying, so there's going to be some younger children there. And now when this letter comes to you, since your master's sons are with you, as well as the chariots and horses and a fortified city and the weapons, select the best and fittest of your master's sons, Set him on his father's throne and fight for your master's house. So Jade was given him a choice. So re- really, he hasn't noted the second option. He just noted, okay, I'm coming. You better get ready. You better fortify. You're in a fortified city. So you take the one you want to be king, put him on the throne, and then I'm coming to get you. Well, those that he has sent letters to, in verse 4, feared greatly. and said, Behold, the two kings did not stand before him. He's talking about the king of Judah and the king of Israel that he killed. He killed both of them in one day, and then just sort of a, you know, an add-on, killed Jezebel, or had her killed. And so these people are afraid. In verse 5, and the one who was over the household and he who was over the city, the elders and the guardians of the children, sent word to Jehu, saying, We are your servants. All that you say to us, we will do. We will not make any man king do what is good in your sight. We're not going to revolt. That would have been a revolt. And and really, Jehu is, is leaving them with the option of just complete surrender. You can fight against me, put somebody in there as king, but you're going to lose. And they recognize that. So, verse 6, he wrote a letter to them a second time saying, If you're on my side, you will listen to my voice. Take the heads of the men, your master's sons, and come to me at Jezreel. Don't bring the bodies. Just bring the heads. Come to me at Jezreel tomorrow about this time. And the king's sons, 70 persons, were with the great men of the city, who were rearing them, and came out when the letter came to them, that took the king's sons, slaughtered them, 70 persons, put their heads in baskets, and sent them to him in Jezreel. When the messenger came and told him, saying, they had brought the heads of the king's sons, he said, put them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until morning. I came about in the morning, they went out and stood and said to the people, you are innocent, behold, I conspired against my master and killed him, But who killed all these? Know then that there shall fall to the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab, for the Lord has done what he spoke (coughs) to his servant Elijah. 
So he says in verse 9, the question is very rhetorical, who killed these? And what he's noting is, this is God's will that the house of Ahab be done. It was already prophesied, and that's the end of the house of Ahab. And of course, this is a favorite way of showing uh, how uh, this individual was killed. You, know, you wouldn't send ears, you wouldn't send a nose, you wouldn't send hands, you'd send the head. The head is the identifiable part of the body. And so that would happen. When uh, uh, Pompey the Great was fighting against uh, Caesar Augustus right after the death of Julius Caesar, there was a civil war that was going on, and the Egyptians got a hold of Pompey and uh, the brother of Cleopatra V, the, the famous Cleopatra, had him killed. And when uh, Augustus heard that that had happened, he was really appalled. But they put uh, in a cask of iron, uh, of wine, a cask of wine, they put the head of Pompey and shipped it back to Rome. Now, the wine would preserve the head. I know this sounds kind of gory. The, the wine would preserve the head. But somewhere on the trip back to Rome, the ship floundered at sea and sank. So somewhere there may be that container still up in the Mediterranean with the head of Pompey inside of that cask. And it might even yet today still be preserved if, it's, if the cask is in, intact and it was completely waterproof. So the sending, <laughs> the sending of a head or the sending of heads was something that would be normally done. Now the piling of heads at the entranceway is also a very ancient ritual. The Assyrians did it all the time. The Assyrians were some of the great headhunters of the ancient world, and they enjoyed taking heads and then piling heads. But the Celtic people were very much the same way. And if you go into Great Britain today and you travel to some of these manor houses, you'll find some stone balls that are found on either side of the entrance into the house. And these stone balls are just, people look at them and say, oh, those are just decorative pieces, but they appear every once in a while in different manor houses that go way back. And really that's a carry-on of the Celts who did the same thing, but the Celt chieftain would bring back the heads of his enemies and then just let them pile, have, be piled out by the entrance to his house where they would just rot away, but they would be the trophies that he would show and and so those stone balls today that you find in English manor houses has, uh, goes all the way back to that Celtish way of keeping heads as souvenirs. How old do you think those 70 sons were? Because that scripture says... Some of them are younger because they're under guardians. And so we would say that they're at a younger age, but they have, really have no idea. Seventy may be a, a symbolic number. There may have been more, there may have been less. But seventy would indicate that all of them were, all of them were destroyed. All of those who would be of the house were taken out of the back. So that's the that's the uh, destruction that would take us down to. Uh, uh, well, let's go down here. <coughs> Verse 10, uh, he says, it's the Lord who has done this. Verse 11, so Jehu killed all who remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all his great men and his acquaintances and his priests until he left him without a survivor. So there are no survivors left out of all of that. Now, verse 17, when he came to Samaria, he killed all who remained to Ahab in Samaria. So he, he took care of all the others at Jezreel. When he goes to Samaria, he destroys them according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. And that takes you back to 1 Kings 21, 29, if you want a cross-reference on that. So the cross-reference for verse 17 
would be 1 Kings 21, 29, concerning Elijah's prophecy concerning the end of the house of Ahab. Now, 2 Kings 10, uh, well, let's let's jump back over to Judah right there in your syllabus. It's a and sub-point H, the princes of Ahaziah's house are going to be killed. 2 Kings 10, verses 12 to 14. It says, Then he departed and went to Samaria. Uh, this is Jehu. And on the way, while he was at Beth Eked of the shepherds, a place uh, in the road, Jehu met the relatives of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and said, Who are you? <laughs> and they answered, We are the relatives of Ahaziah. They obviously haven't gotten the message yet. And we have come down to greet the sons of the king, that would be of Joram, and the sons of the queen mother, who would be Jezebel. Well, Jezebel's dead, Joram's dead, Ahaziah's dead, these guys are out on the road, and who do they come to meet but Jehu? And they don't have any of the information that they're standing right in front of the guy that's taking care of all of these that they've come to see. So it's not going to be much of a not much of a family get together <laughs> as a as a result of all of this. And so in verse. 14, and he said, take them alive. So they took them alive and killed them at the pit. Now the pit is probably a cistern. A cistern is, and that's not the brethren and the sister. A cistern <laughs> is a deep pit that's used for water runoff. It's not a well. It's a storage. And they dig down into the rock. And, and they make it uh, as deep as they want in order that it might hold water. And then they put a cover on the top of it. During the rainy season, they leave it open so that it will fill with water. As soon as the rainy season is finished, then they put a, a stone on top of that and then keep it until the dry season. <coughs> have to go, and the wells run dry, and they have to go and get some more water. So this is probably what this is, is a cistern. Killed them at the pit of Beth Aked, 42 men, and he left none of them. So he's not only taking care of Ahaziah, but he's also taking care of Jehoram. <coughs> he's taking care of all of the house of Ahab, and now he's taking care of the rest of the house of Ahaziah. Well, not exactly all the rest of the house of Ahaziah. Because if he did that, then the seed line would be gone. So the seed line's not yet gone. And so down through down through verse 14, all the princes are killed. And then just cross back over to 2 Kings 10, verses 15 and 16, and we'll see a fellow by the name of Jehonadab. It said, Now, when he had departed from there, he met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab. Now we'll take a look, a look at uh, Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, a little bit later on. But uh, he is uh, he is a Kenite, and we come across the Kenites uh, over here in uh, Genesis 15, and they're an old people. They're a nomadic people. They're a very moral people, and we're going to see some of that morality later on. But uh, over in Genesis 15 and verse 19, when Abram, when a covenant is made with Abram, saying, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt. That's a place that's really called Wadi El Arish. That's not the Nile River. As far as the great river, that's the Euphrates, and that's what it says there. The Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Raphaim, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. So the Kenites are mentioned as the people who are living in the land all the way back in Genesis 15 and uh, verse 19. 
but uh, they, they are of an Arab nationality, and uh, they get mixed up a little bit later on with the Amalekites. But uh, just keep in mind, this Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, and sometimes they're referred to as Rechabites, and uh, we'll talk about them later, but we'll come back and note this individual. But Jehonadab lends his support to Jehu, 2 Kings 10, verses 15 and 16. So when he had departed from the destruction of the relatives of Ahaziah, uh, the son of Rechab was coming, Jehonadab, coming to meet him, and he greeted him and said, Is your heart right? Is my heart is with your heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. Jehu said, If it is, give me your hand. <laughs> Would you sort of hesitate to give your hand to Jehu? <laughs> and he gave him his hand, and he took him up into the chariot. And he said, Come with me. See my zeal for the Lord. So he made him ride in his chariot. So Jehonadab is going to be with him. He lends his support at this particular time to Jehu. And then the complete success of Jehu is noted in verse 17. When he came to Samaria, he killed all who remained to Ahab in Samaria till he had destroyed him according to the word of the Lord which he spoke to Elijah. So Jehu's complete success, all the house of Ahab has been done in, and a goodly number of the house of Ahab. So when you're looking at your outline in the syllabus, you're going to know we're going to start all over again with a ruler in Judah and a ruler in Israel. But the problem is the ruler in Judah is going to be a woman. And this is when Athaliah steps forward, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. She steps forward, and she is going to take over the throne through a force of arms. So they weren't killing the women, too, from the families? They were just killing the sons? They usually just killed off the men. Because the line goes through the men. So if you get rid of the men, you've gotten rid of the line. They haven't gotten rid of all the men in this particular case with uh, Judah. God, God will make sure that there's a preservation that takes place. So you come down to king number 11. King number 11 under Israel is Jehu. Jehu's going to be around for 28 years. A long chariot driver. 2 Kings 10, verses 18 through 28, when he comes to the throne, he's going to do something that is sort of unusual, and it really does look good for Jehu. But remember, he's the king of Israel. I've already told you that all the kings of Israel are rotten to the core. So Jehu starts out with the possibility of being a good king, the first good king, king number 11, the first good king in the northern king of Israel. So in 2 Kings 10, beginning with verse 18, since he's already taking care of all sorts of people with the edge of the sword, uh, he may be doing some more of that. So in verse 18, we're going to see he comes to the throne and he's going to destroy Baal. Uh, this is the Israel. Who introduced Baal into Israel? Jeroboam. Solomon. Solomon. No, Israel is the northern king of Israel, so Solomon, it would have been the whole nation of Israel. He doesn't introduce Baal. Isn't it Jezebel? Jezebel. Yeah. Jezebel is the one that introduces Baal worship into the northern kingdom of Israel. So Jehu, verse 18, gathered all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, Jehab will, Je Jehu will serve him much. Well, you say, ooh, that's a bad move. But just wait a minute, that's not the whole story. And now summon all the priests of Baal, all his worshippers and all his priests, let no one be missing, for I have a great sacrifice for Baal. That's tongue-in-cheek right there. <laughs> I have a great sacrifice for Baal. 
Whoever is missing shall not live. But Jehu did it in cunning in order that he might destroy the worshippers of Baal. So it's a trick. Jehu said, Sanctify a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. Then Jehu went throughout Israel, and all the worshippers of Baal came. So there was not a man left who did not come. And when they went to the house of Baal, the house of Baal was filled from one end to the other. And he said to the one who was in charge of the wardrobe, Bring out garments for all the worshippers of Baal. So he brought out garments for them. Jehu went into the house of Baal with Jehonadab, the son of Rechab. Remember the one he invited to come up into the chariot, the Kenite? And he said to the worshippers of Baal, Search and see if there may be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but only the worshippers of Baal. Then they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had stationed for himself 80 men outside, and he said, The one who permits any of the men whom I bring into your hands to escape shall give up his life in exchange. Then it came about as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering. The Jehu said to the guard and to the royal officers, Go in, kill them, let none come out. And they killed them with the edge of the sword, and the guard and the royal officers threw them out and went to the inner room of the house of Baal. And they brought up the sacred pillars of the house of Baal and burned them. They also broke down the sacred pillar of Baal and broke down the house of Baal, made it a latrine. And by latrine, a public toilet. To this, thus Jehu eradicated Baal out of Israel. And you think, well, he's got somebody going in the right direction. Finally. So the Lord promises to Jehu's house the promises of result. What was the question? Nothing. I just said, yeah, but he leaves the golden calf. Oh, the golden calf? Second Kings 10, verse 30, says, And the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in executing what is right in my eyes, and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that is in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So there was something good that was done and was noted by God to Jehu. But perhaps Jehu becomes a little bit too prideful in all this because when we come down to uh, chapter 10, verses 29 and 31, it says, However, as for the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, which he made Israel sin, from these Jehu did not depart, even the golden calves that were at Bethel and that were at Dan. Now remember that the golden calf is both a political symbol and a religious symbol. Politically, it is that the people might not go all the way to Jerusalem to worship God. You can worship God here. Well, how are we going to worship God here? Well, the golden calf represents God. We put one at Dan. We put one at Bethel. You just have to go that far, just a, a few miles uh, away from home, and you just go down. You, of course, it's not measured in miles. The kind of measurement's not noted. It'd be measured more in a day's journey or two days' journey. Something like that would be related to time rather than distance. Luke? I know I've asked this before, but I just want to make absolutely sure before I teach this anywhere else. Okay. You're saying people said that the golden calf was a representative of Yahweh. That's what he made them to be like, and that takes you all the way back to Mount Sinai. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that they, he necessarily <coughs> the son need not believe in God, but you remember that he's had a prophet of God come to him and tear a garment into ten pieces and give him ten pieces and yeah. all of that. So there may be something that he might believe as far as God is concerned. But politically it's to keep the people from going all the way to Jerusalem and supposedly religiously it is to represent God. We know that's wrong because it's great in Israel. I know I haven't been in here but why would God choose someone to tell all this that doesn't even worship him alone? I, just, I don't understand that I guess. Well, because God has a plan. God's plan is to destroy the whole house of Ahab, and so he has to choose someone to do that. And he chooses this individual who would have reason enough to do it. 
And that would be because in his pride he wants to be king. So that's why he would choose that individual. So it's all it's all God's working. God has promised that the house of Ahab would come to a violent end. So if he's made that promise, he's going to raise someone up to do it. That's who he raises up. This this mindset of um, the golden calf being political in, in nature, wouldn't that also indicate the the influence of the other nations around Israel? Because didn't they also view their gods? You know, they they had they worshipped their gods, they had their religion. But for them, their gods were also political as well. That's right. That's right. So it's, it's very much in keeping with, with the Gentiles that surrounded them. It's very much in keeping with the Egyptians mm. where they got the original idea from. Mm. Dur- during all this time of the divided kingdom, were the people free to travel back yeah. and forth? Yeah, they could travel back and forth. There's nobody at the border, no razor wire, no, nothing like that, no... Uh, no walls. It's just, and and the the free commerce was necessary because all of these tribes relied on merchants traveling in caravans from all different parts of, of the world coming through and trade goods and all of that. So none of that none of that was ever stopped. So commerce just moved freely, and the people moved freely with it. And it's too much of a border to, to enforce. It's, it's about like our border with Mexico. <laughs> it's rather porous. And uh, just, just couldn't, couldn't keep the people out. Of course, God is going to use any of his creation for his own purpose. So he uses Jehu here. Later on, he's going to use the Assyrians, who are probably the most cruel of all ancient warriors against the northern kingdom of Israel. They're Gentiles. He will then use the Babylonians as he gets rid of the Assyrians. He'll use the Babylonians against the southern kingdom of Judah to take them out of the way. Again, they are cruel, not quite as cruel as their cousins, the Assyrians, but they're cruel also. And uh, that's God's way of dealing with the sin problem. Those nations fall as a result of the wine vat. When the wine vat's full, uh, gets in and treads out the grapes. And so it was time for Ahab's lineage to end, and Jehu's the one who chose to do that. Now things are different, of course, when he's dealing with Judah and Jerusalem because of the messianic line that we're dealing with. So there we have, uh, we have Jehu's uh, real character, and uh, it's seen in the, the fact that uh, he's gotten rid of the Baal worship, but he's, he's not uh, gotten rid of the golden catch. Verse 31 will show you some individual responsibility. It says in verse 31, it's still talking about Jehu's character, which is at the bottom of the syllabus here on page 29. <laughs> It says in verse 31, But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. So some of what he did was good, but a great deal of what he did was not. That's about the only ray of hope you'll ever, you'll ever see for Jehu. And some things he did were right, but... Uh, he was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. So it, it was just a, a very sporadic worship of God here and there. And then it says, he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel sin. So we see the individual responsibility, and we see that he's not left in a very good light in the league hand. So... If you come back over to the other side, we're going to look at Judah, and we're going to look at the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, and there's a void right now because Ahaziah has been killed off, and uh, the relatives of Ahaziah have been killed off, and Athaliah probably believes at this point in time 
if I'm ever going to strike out and take over the throne and run Judah the way I believe it needs to be run, now's the time to strike. And so she comes to the throne in 2 Kings 11, and the latter part of verse 3, when it says, Athaliah was reigning over the land. And what she does is, if you note in 2 Kings 11, verse 1, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, this is Ahaziah who was killed by Jehu, she is the, she is the wife of Joram, Joram of Judah, remember. So she's the wife of Joram of Judah. She's the mother of Ahaziah. Ahaziah was killed by Jehu, saw that her son was dead. She rose. That might be a slight moment of grief. Oh, boo That's about it. And destroyed all the royal offspring. What does that mean? She destroyed all the royal offspring. Killed all of his sons. Killed all of her grandkids. grandkids. Oh, isn't this a wonderful example of a godly grandmother? I mean, instead of rocking them on her knee, she's out killing them. Wow. So she wants to come to the throne and that there be no survivors who might say, wait a minute, you can't be on the throne. So that's what she does. Now, we're, we're not looking at her killing any of the girls. She's going to kill all of her grandsons. That would be what would, would take place. And so she attempts to do that. And uh, But look at uh, 2 Kings 11, verse 2. It says, But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah. Well, she's the sister of Ahaziah. She's probably a half-sister. Her mother may not be Athaliah. Took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, stole him from among the king's sons who were being put to death, and placed him and his nurse in the bedroom Nurse is used in the sense of its original thought. We, we come to look at a nurse as a medical technician. The nurse is a woman who nurses children. Breastfeeding, what we're looking at. So the one who is nursing him in the bedroom, the, the bedroom is literally in the Hebrew, a chamber of the beds. And it would be a special room in the palace where the bedding would be kept. Now, don't get in your mind you got a whole bunch of sort of mattresses all piled up. Because this is before mattresses have been invented. But bedding would be those uh, garments that would be used, like for blankets. All of that bedding that would be used... Uh, as a foundational bedding, whatever you're going to lie down on, whether it's a straw tick mattress or whatever it is at, at, the, at that particular time, that's where they stored all of the bedding. Usually in ancient times, bedding was aired out every day. And it's still true if, you are, if you're traveling in rural Germany and you have to get into some of the small towns, You'll see some of the houses that have balconies, and there'll be bedding that will be laid over the balcony being aired out each day. And that's just a tradition that has come down. Even though they have real modern bedding, they still... I, I, of course, Germany is such a clean place. If you're, traveling, if you're walking down the street, it's nothing to see a, uh, a German Frau, a German housewife, sweeping not only the sidewalk, was sweeping the curbing and the street in front of her house. Mm. Uh, just very, very clean that way. So the laying out of the bedding still seems to be a tradition in rural Germany at least. And it was very typical of ancient times. Air out the bedding and then there would be extra bedding. That extra bedding would be stored. And it's in this room that 
only the servants would go into an occasion where the child has been hidden away with his nurse. Verse 3, so he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord. Now, in the palace area, the chamber of the beds, that would be a different place than the house of the Lord. But the, if you'll note that uh, the sister of Ahaziah, Jehoshaphat, we're going to find out in just a moment that Jehoshaphat is married to the high priest. Mm-hmm. And so into the house of the Lord here in verse 3 is going to be the home of the high priest. The home of the high priest would be in the courtyard area of the temple. Remember, when you're looking at the temple, you're not looking just at the just at the uh, building with the holy place and the holy of holies or the place where the altar is. Uh, is located, the altar burnt offering, or the place where the washing of the sacrifices, the, the brazen labor is located. But when you get away from all of that that's within close proximity, then you get into a courtyard area. And there's the court of the women, there's a court of the Gentiles. And in these court areas, and in fact, off to the side of the court areas, there is an area called the Portico of Solomon, which is an enclosed porch area of Solomon's temple where people would come and they'd be able to relax in the shade and and discuss uh, religious matters. And so there are a lot of different areas in the uh, temple area itself, within the walls of the temple area. And even in Jesus' time, when Herod's temple is is, uh, even more magnificent and larger than the temple that was built by Solomon, you even have an expansion of all of this area. And uh, there's housing in there. And it's housing for those who are working in the temple, for those who are priests. And the high priest would have a house there in the court area of the temple. So when it says he was he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord, that would be in the house of the priest, not in the temple proper. Six years, six years he's going to be in the house of Jehoshaphat, who is the wife of Jehoiada. Jehoiada is going to be noted here in verse 4. So Jehoiada is the high priest, Jehoshaphat is his wife, and she was gutsy enough to get in there and get this child, and so the line, the messianic line will not be destroyed. And here's another time where it looks like Satan's going to win. And if he can somehow get uh, to cut off the messianic line, then he's not going to have any worries concerning the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent and anything that might go along with that and Satan himself being crushed somewhere down the line, uh, going back to Genesis 3, if you hold that to be uh, something that is actually within the Messianic line. But there is an attempt by him throughout history to get rid of that line. Because out of that line, someone somewhere is going to get him. Is there any indication somewhere that maybe he got a, a vision from God or a prophet came to tell him to have his wife do it or she just went and did it on her own? No, there's there's no indication that God intervened here. He, he certainly could have. And, uh, I would expect that he would want to preserve the line. The whole reason for uh, God overlooking many times the hardness of heart among those of Israel and in particular concerning Judah and all of that is for preservation of the Messianic line. Because the Messianic line has to be preserved, otherwise we're sort of spinning our wheels by even having a school like Bear Valley. <laughs> uh, not to get sidetracked here, but he says something I find it interesting. So, do you suppose that Satan understood the Messianic prophecy? That, that, I mean, because we see in Job that he's clearly interested in human affairs. He's, he's roaming the earth. He's seeking out those. We see that in First Peter as well. So, 
Could he have had an active interest in those kinds of problems? Well, I don't believe he has any more knowledge than any other created being. Right. So he doesn't have an all-knowingness. Right, right, exactly. So whatever information he, and he's not stupid. That's true. We read of that. So any information that he has gleaned from all of these things that are taking place in history, he's sort of assimilating all that information together and making a determination that it looks like he's made a determination that he needs to get rid of the seed line. He'll go after Jesus, you remember, in the temptation. And that's probably not the last time he goes after Jesus. It may be more subtle than it was at that particular time. And, of course, when Jesus dies on the cross, you almost have to believe that he is almost consumed in a fit of laughter because he's won, but then the resurrection kills that laughter real fast. You know, in 1 Peter 1, I forget which verse, it talks about the angels were longing to look at the things we've now got revealed in the Gospels so that the angels didn't really understand what was going on. His knowledge would have been just the same as the knowledge that they would have gained. Yeah. He's a very focused individual, by the way. He's very focused on your destruction. He's very focused on getting rid of Bear Valley. Why do you think he's not listed in the genealogy of Matthew? This one right here? Yeah. There are a number that are not listed in the genealogy. He's one of them. That's not unusual for genealogies among the Jews. For them, you just leave a name out here and there. And so that doesn't mean the genealogy is not complete. It just means that from Joram to Uzziah, right there in Matthew 1, verse 8, for some reason that's just been left out. So that's his son, right? Uzziah is Joash's son, is that right? That's what? Uzziah is Joash's son, right? Yeah, is that right? What do we do? We've got more than one that's left out of there, out of that line. And we're talking about the genealogy of Matthew 1. And that's the genealogy, of course, that is the seed line genealogy that comes through Joseph. Well, we've got verse 8 says to Joram. Joram is noted right there, or Jehoram. And then you've got to go to Ahaziah. Ahaziah is not mentioned. And then you've got to go to Joash. That's the child we're looking at right now. And then you've got to go from Joash to Amaziah. Amaziah is not mentioned. Then it goes to Uzziah. And it may be because it's really an embarrassing period of time because Athaliah has forcibly taken over the throne. So it may be that that section of the genealogy is left out because to not leave it out would require putting Athaliah's name in there. But don't know. Don't know for sure. But everything else, you know, lines up and is correct. So Athaliah, this wonderful grandmother, is out to kill all of her grandchildren and save one, save one, save by one. And so you have this child that is saved. And her attempt is not going to be successful because of the rescue of Joash. So we're looking at 2 Kings 11, verse 2 and verse 3a, hidden. Then when we go to the next page, which would be page 30, Joash, in Athaliah's seventh year of reign, 
is elevated to the throne by Jehoiada. Now, we've not been introduced to Jehoiada, but here he is. And so we pick that up in verses 4 through 12. It says, now in the seventh year, that, in the seventh year that Athaliah is reigning. So we would assume that she is uh, wicked all this time. We would also assume that whatever is going on in the temple is going on because of Jehoiada is standing up to her. And uh, maybe because of, uh, of, of the daughter Jehoshaphat that uh, worship is continuing on in the temple. But she's an ungodly woman, this Athaliah. So it says, now in the seventh year, Jehoiada, uh, you can cross-reference Second Chronicles 22, verse 11, with the name Jehoiada there. That will indicate that he is the husband of Jehoshaphat. Second Chronicles? Second Chronicles 22, 11, with the name Jehoiada. Now in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of hundreds of the Karaites. The Karaites are traditionally the king's military bodyguard. So they've remained faithful to the righteous. And of the guard, uh, literally of the runners, uh, guard is, is probably not a better translation, but the messengers, the runners, <coughs> and brought them to them to him in the house of the Lord, then he made a covenant with them, put them under oath. And this would be the kind of oath that he'd say, now I'm going to tell you something, but before I tell you, you absolutely have to vow right now that it will be a secret. And if you can't keep this vow, then you need to leave. Put them under an oath in the house of the Lord. And that would be an indication of that this is an oath before God. And showed them the king's son. <coughs> and he commanded them, saying, This is the thing you shall do. One third of you who come in on the Sabbath and keep watch over the king's house. One third also shall be at the gate, sir. And one third at the gate behind the guards shall keep watch over the house for defense. So he's lining them all up in a military fashion to form a bodyguard around this young heir to the throne. And two parts of you, even all who go out on the Sabbath, shall also keep watch over the house of the Lord for the king. Then you shall surround the king, each with his weapons in his hand, and whoever comes within the rank shall be put to death. No questions asked. And be with the king when he goes out and when he comes in. So the captains of the hundreds did according to all that Jehovah the priest commanded. And each one of them took his men who were to come in on the Sabbath with those who were to go out on the Sabbath. And came to Jehovah the priest. And the priest gave the captains of the hundreds the spears and the shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of the Lord. So there's an armory right there. He's got all the weapons. And the guard stood each with his weapon in his hand from the right side of the house to the left side of the house by the altar and by the house around the king. Then he brought the king's son out and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. Now that's always done that the word of God is given to the king. Now the king will be required, may not be for this king who is this young, uh, but it will be required that the king make a copy of his own. And so the testimony is given, the word of God is given to the king. He will make then a copy and return this other copy back to the place where it's stored. And they made him king and anointed him, and they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. When Athaliah, this is Athaliah's death now, when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard, and of the people, she came to the people in the house of the Lord. See, she normally doesn't frequent the place. So, but when she hears all this noise, she said, I better get over and find out what's happening. And she looked, and behold, the king was standing by the pillar. Now, this standing by the pillar, if you go back to 2 Kings 23 and verse 3, or over to 2 Kings 23 verse 3, is a special place 
If you look at 2 Kings 23.3, says, And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all, and all his soul to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people entered into the covenant. So there you have, in this particular case, this is Josiah, who is going to end up being the greatest king of Judah. So standing by the pillar is of great significance. We don't know exactly which pillar this would have been, but there was a certain pillar within the temple area who was designated as the one who, that the king would stand by whenever he was to make an oath. So he is there standing by the pillar according to the custom. So there's nothing in the law Nothing in the law. First of all, God required the tabernacle to be built, gave the design, gave all the materials to be used. But when it came to the temple, which ended up being David's idea, it could not be accomplished by David, but only in Solomon's time, there is no architectural design given by God. People are free to do as they would. And so it is a permanent structure, the temple versus the tabernacle. So you have pillars holding up the roof. And he is standing by the <coughs> pillar. That indicates a special pillar. That's all we know about it. According to the custom. With the captains and the trumpeters beside the king, this is verse 14 of 2 Kings 11. And all the people of the land rejoiced and blew trumpets. Then Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, Treason! Treason! She knows what's going on. And Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds who were appointed over the army, said to them, Bring her out between the ranks. Whoever follows her put to death with the sword. To see who her friends really are. <laughs> well, the priest said, Let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. This is Jehoiada. He's the high priest. He knows what's going on and how you don't desecrate the temple. This would desecrate the temple. So they seized her, and when she arrived at the horse's entrance of the king's house, that always amazed me that we've gotten to the point where you not, not only have horses, but now you have horses' entrances. To the king's house, she was put to death there. So the place where the horse would, would normally trample and uh, probably in some area that was uh, uh, not all that significant. That's where they put her to death. So the points to remember in Athaliah's reign, she attempted to kill all the seed royal, and she is killed by her own people. And so Joash is going to be the new king of Judah. He's going to reign for 40 years years. And while he has as his tutor, his schoolmaster, Jehoiada, who's like a father to him, and Jehoshaphat, who's like a mother to him, he's going to be a good king. <coughs> he's going to be a good king. And he's really going to have that guiding hand of the high priest who's going to be there all the time. So, 2 Kings 12 and verse 1 notes the beginning. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash became king. He reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibia of Beersheba. And then it goes on to note uh, his character here in just a moment. But in 2 Kings 11, go back there to verse 17, this is the connection between Jehoiada and uh, Joash, this, and this is going to be the influence. So look at uh, 2 Kings 11, uh, verses 17 through 20, that Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people. They should be the Lord's people, also between the king and the people. And all the people of the land went to the house of Baal and tore it down. So Baal is there in Jerusalem. We saw it in Israel because of Jezebel. But remember, Jezebel's family is intermingled with the family of the king of Judah. 
Athaliah is the daughter of Jezebel. So if you got Athaliah, the daughter of Jezebel, why wouldn't you have Baal worship with Athaliah? Tore it down, his altars, his images, they broke in pieces thoroughly. Killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. And he took the captains of hundreds and the Karaites and the guards and all the people of the land. They brought the king down from the house of the Lord. He came by the way of the gate of the guards to the king's house. And he sat on the throne of the kings. And all, so all the people of the land rejoiced. And the city was quiet. So they put Athaliah to death with the sword of the king's house. And then in verse 21 it notes... And Joash, or Jehoash, <laughs> the Hebrew does this all, all, to us all the time. Sometimes it shortens the name. Sometimes it gives us the lengthened version of the name. So we have Joash, but he's also really known as Jehoash. He was seven years old when he became king. So he was just a baby when he was hidden away. A nursing baby. And so he, at seven years of age, becomes king. Now, he'll not be able to rule properly except through the influence of Jehoiada. So when you look at 2 Kings 12, verse 2, it says, And Jehoash did right in the sight of the Lord all his days, in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. So there's the influence of a godly individual. And you may have been influenced by a godly individual. And this influence of this godly individual, of course, is written in Scripture. And if we didn't have this godly individual, all sorts of terrible things might have happened to the seed line. And, of course, this is all within the plan of God. It's all within the knowledge of God. And all of this <coughs> takes place. So we'll stop at 2 Kings 12 and verse 2. And we'll stop at 2 Kings 12 and verse 3. So at the bottom of the syllabus. If I have any questions, any thoughts? It's a great lesson with him. Mm-hmm. And everybody knows the kings and and all those. When we think about what. What can I do as one person? Yeah. I may not be remembered, but that one little boy that I influence, that one little boy, may grow up to be the next marshal. Here's the case of a woman, see, a woman who stepped out and grabbed a hold of that child. Mm-hmm. He was his. 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 He was his.